One of my earliest reviews looked at the Taiwanese B-movie classic, Master of the Flying Guillotine, which is simultaneously thrilling and hilarious. <laughs> Jimmy Wong Yu's movie was, of course, riffing on the previous year's excellent The Flying Guillotine from the Shaw Brothers across the water in Hong Kong, which spawned a short series of sequels, knockoffs, cameos, and a reboot. The Flying Guillotine probably never existed, but it's so cool that it just won't go away in the movies. It's a flingable hat lined with blades, usually both inside and out, on a long leash, sometimes with fancy mechanics. An assassin throws it onto the head of their victim, yanks, and voila, a headless corpse tumbles onto the ground. Aside from the first film, they don't really show what happens to the head usually. Maybe some models came with a garbage disposal. It's crazy fun to watch. Everybody falls to the guillotine. Kung fu masters, generals, other guillotine experts, one-armed men. A surprisingly large number of one-armed men. Ho Minghua launched the guillotine's legacy in 1975. As my fellow Shaw Brothers reviewer and enthusiast Robert Welkner has pointed out, flying weapons seem to be a fetish for Ho Minghua. The director really likes to make movies where people are throwing things out that, uh, you know, is kind of known for the flying guillotine or dragon missile. What can I do that's a little different? The Shaw Brothers studios all have people throwing things, so we got killer darts uh, this time around. Vengeful Beauty has a bevy of creative weapons, including a sword-baton combo that turns into a spear and has a hidden projectile hook, used only once for some reason. Such inventiveness shows up often in Chinese action cinema, of course, but it seems to be a real favorite theme of Ho's, along with gooey horror, hot chicks, and genuinely great action movies. <laughs> Ho Ming Hua's original film is a tight action thriller that is at once wildly chaotic and comfortingly predictable. You can see where the plot is headed just as much as nobody in this movie can see where the flying guillotine be headed. <sighs> yeah, okay. A military officer has invented the ultimate distance weapon in Qing era China, aside from rifles of course, and trains a crack squad of assassins to use it. The emperor begins to eliminate all threats to his power, but he goes over the edge and one assassin, Ma Teng, played by the great Chen Quan Tai, gets sick of all of this and goes AWOL. Fleeing to the countryside, he settles down and raises a family on a farm. Obviously, you can't run from trouble. There ain't no place that far. Shaw Brothers movies often distinguish themselves in their second act. You can count on Act 1 setting up the conceit, and a bang-up action finale in Act 3, sometimes even in middle-of-the-road films. But Act 2 is where the heart is, and Flying Guillotine really shines there. Our fugitive assassin, besieged in an alleyway, is rescued by a street singer whom he has shown kindness to. The scene is simultaneously brutal and beautiful. Meanwhile, Ku Feng, as the mastermind behind the guillotine squad, slowly realizes that he's put too much faith in both the unhinged emperor and his own team, and he gets caught up in the very court intrigue that he was trying to end. And Wei Hung, who also shows up in The Vengeful Beauty, creeps slowly into full-on villain territory. I think it's interesting that Wei Hung despite his imposing bearing and good looks, very rarely played a hero, but he's quite good in Flying Guillotine 1 and Vengeful Beauty as a real creep. One big difference between this and the subsequent guillotine movies is that the decapitations are taken seriously. We see the victim's horror and the grief of their loved ones or colleagues as the body topples to the ground. We also see the emotional weight of being an assassin, something captured in the best gangster films like Le Samurai, The Killer, Leon, and The Flying Guillotines. Chen Quan Tai had a few typical roles in his early career, including, of course, the upright Shaolin lay disciple, but you could also count on him for solid and serious gangster-type roles, the boxer from Shantung being the most famous of these. Ma Teng combines these two elements and gives Chen a lot to work with as an actor. <laughs> Despite the first movie's popularity, plans for a sequel stalled out for many reasons. Chin Quan Tai argued with the studio and eventually left the production. Ho Meng Hua went off to do the Dragon Missile, which was in some ways just a remake of Flying Guillotine with a different weapon. Lo Lie plays a more sinister, reluctant rebel than Chin Quan Tai does, and his predicament in providing a difficult-to-find elixir to save his evil boss is more nuanced than what Ma Tung is up against. Overall, Dragon Missile stands up as a very enjoyable film, but it lacks the simple clarity of the Flying Guillotine, or its scope. Unlike most Shaw Brothers 70s films, the flying guillotine spans years in the characters' lives, rather than just one or two bloody weeks. <laughs> During the gap between the films, two Taiwanese studios leapt on the flying guillotine concept. Jimmy Wang Yu put out Master of the Flying Guillotine, which I've reviewed previously and is maybe the most famous of these movies. Wang Yu does an impressive job of taking the flying guillotine and running in a completely different direction. There's no assassin squad, there's loads of supernatural hijinks, and a far lighter tone than Ho Minghua's outing.
The Deadly Flying Guillotine, also released in 1975, is the lowest budget of the lot, but I think it's worth a watch. Production quality is on the C-movie level, but the villain, a similar character to the blind monk and master of the flying guillotine, is played with even more calm menace. He's actually pretty scary, and the kills are never played for laughs like they are in Master of the Flying Guillotine. His guillotines, enticingly called the Bloody Whirls in this version, are terrifying bronze bells which go into hyperdrive as if powered by jet engines. They follow their victims with drone-like navigation capabilities. The physics make even less sense than in the Shaw Brothers films, but these things scare the pants off of me. They have the same eerie inevitability as the sphere in Phantasm for those 80s horror fans out there. The hero is a son of a guillotine master who joins a troop of monks on a mission to retrieve a medical manual. After trickery around the manual led to the death of the hero's mother, the monks pursue the villain's henchmen into the Valley of No Return, which is actually a clearing on the other side of a cave full of deadly traps. I love me some deadly traps. This plot may sound complex, but the movie's basically a string of action scenes and decapitations. Oh, and Castle Thunder. Lots and lots of that one sound effect that may be the defining trait of Corman movies and Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. Fun watching for a lazy afternoon if you got one. After two years of wrangling, Flying Guillotine 2 finally emerged. With a new lead, new director, and copycats across the strait, the Shaws had to up the ante somehow. Chin Kwon Tai as Ma Teng was replaced by superstar T. Long, and the usual roster of Shaw Brothers top-tier character actors appear as well. To top the original Flying Guillotine, now the device hovers in mid-air making sinister flying saucer sounds before dispatching its victims. But how do you really up the stakes? You make an anti-guillotine. Basically, it's a steel umbrella. Not to be outdone, a wily inventor is hired by the brutal Qing Emperor, played now by Ku Feng, to counter the umbrella. And how do you improve a flying guillotine? With a double guillotine. The new model neutralizes the umbrella and then decouples to behead the umbrella's user. But aha! Ma Teng then creates a double umbrella to stop the double guillotine, sending the guillotine back to kill its own user. Somehow this is all played completely straight. This genius versus genius chess match, however, is overtaken by a main plot. The daughter of a Qing minister is actually a mole in the palace and a great kung fu artist. She and a squad of female fighters join the ranks of the flying guillotines, and the finale is a satisfying girl squad versus boy squad battle. One complaint about the first films is that it's more of a drama than a martial arts film. Not a complaint from me, the movie stays true to itself. Flying Guillotine 2 satisfies with more action, but gets muddled in the middle with more characters and more plot lines. It's not the lean, mean affair the first film was, but it's certainly a fun time at the movies. <laughs> The third and last of the Shaw Brothers flying guillotine films, The Vengeful Beauty, is mostly entertaining. Mostly. When one of the guillotine assassins is captured, the Emperor sends Lo Lie and his men to kill everybody at the trial. Lo Lie swears he has eliminated all witnesses, but unfortunately one has escaped. The judge's wife, played by Chen Ping, who also happens to be a fantastic martial artist. But she's pregnant, and she'll only go so far before risking the child of her deceased husband. She connects with another fugitive, played by Norman Chui, essentially the same as the Ma Tung character, earlier played by Chung Huan Tai and Ti Lung. Chen Ping also keeps bumping into her martial brother, played by Yue Hua, with her husband only just assassinated, Chen Ping is caught between her duty to her child, her long affection for Yue Hua, and the bubbling passion between her and the Ma Tung-like hero. Meanwhile, the evil minister's children are sent out one by one to kill the fugitives, leading to lots of entertaining fights and a twisty-turny plot. So far, so good. <laughs> On the other hand, the film revels in exploitation. Okay, the scenes of a villainess seductively skinny dipping and then fighting in slow motion toplessness are tacky to the point of being funny, which you can say of other Ho Meng Hua films. Only he could make a sexy Sun Wukong movie like Cave of the Silken Web or Land of Many Perfumes with a straight face, or create the trauma studios like Oily Maniac. But like Oily Maniac, the sleaze here gets to a nauseating level as it follows Chin Ping through a lonely miscarriage in the woods. That sequence pretty much kills the movie for me. The other bummer is that the guillotine itself only shows up in a handful of scenes. Sure, there are other action scenes with other weapons, but it never has that same overabundance of decapitation the viewer craves. And that's really too bad, because this movie has some high points. Maybe the best being Norman Chui, fending off the mighty flying guillotine squad with porcelain dishes. Sadly, Vengeful Beauty is the worst of the flying guillotine films, and the weapon only reappeared afterwards as a brief gimmick in a few other movies. <laughs> 
But decades later, the mighty Andy Lau did a big budget remake of the original Flying Guillotine. It follows the original's plot fairly closely, but tries for more of an epic scope that gets bogged down in pretty bad CGI. It failed to relaunch interest in the series, but as for me, I left the theater relatively happy. Even someone as prolific, talented, and broad-spirited as Andy Lau will produce a dud once in a while. The movie plays with the racial conflict between the Manchurians and the Han Chinese, as did Flying Guillotine 2, where a kidnapped Han woman gets slain expressly because of her ethnicity. Once Andy Lau's Ma Tung-style hero learns that he's actually Han and is oppressing his own people, he abandons the Flying Guillotine squad. As an American, this is considerably less appealing to me than Chen Kuang Tai's Crise de Conscience. It does, however, harken back to the legend that the Emperor Qianlong, one of the only good Qing emperors, was secretly a Han child placed on the throne. <laughs> So there's a quick trip down Flying Guillotine Lane. Lots of fun films, a couple of them classics, and really only one and a half duds. If you ask me which movies to watch and in what order, I actually recommend the chronological order by release date. The Flying Guillotine is the good one. Master of the Flying Guillotine is the fun one. Fatal Flying Guillotine, or whatever it's being called, is an amuse-bouche. Uh, you know, it's a throwaway. And Flying Guillotine 2 and 3 are subsequent steps down. Finally, you have Andy Lau's self-important reboot, which is okay, but it carries more weight if you already know the film's history. Thanks for watching this. I hope this inspires a good rewatch or a first-time watching of these inventive classics. Until next time.